Today's video is going to be a little bit different. I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. I'm usually used to shooting in gyms and boxing places and getting really moody fitness scenes, but today is something a little bit different. Now, I have been collaborating with my friend Petra, who's not only a director, but also a choreographer as well, and she wanted to show some of the work that she was working on. But in today's video, I wanted to show you guys how you could leverage your location and still practice cinematography, even though it's not the biggest story-driven piece in the world. We're also gonna be doing this entirely on the Blackmagic 6K full frame, so that's gonna be fun as well, but uh, we'll get there. Now, before talking about the tech gear and the lighting breakdown, I actually wanna go through some of the inspiration because that's gonna drive some of our technical choices. If you're somebody that's becoming a cinematographer, doing research in terms of finding out how you actually wanna shoot something almost becomes just as important as some of the gear choices and the lighting and all the other stuff that goes into a shoot. Now, the song that we used for this choreography was going to be He Wasn't Man Enough by Tony Braxton. Now, it's copyrighted, so you're probably not gonna see the final product on here, but I'll leave a link in the description down below. Now, around the time that that song came out and a lot of the music videos around the era was kind of where I was going to start to set some of my research in terms of how I was going to pick my technical choices. One of the things that I noticed is that there was a lot of shots that were locked off and another thing is that the, a lot of the shots were wide angle as well and with the sets that were there there was a mixture of having black and white images or monochromatic images and letting the location kind of speak for itself because at the time I don't think everybody had a gimbal. Now although this is going to be more of a choreography piece and not necessarily a music video some of the shots had to actually gear towards seeing the dancers at work rather than highlighting an artist, which means that a lot of the tight shots, the 50 millimeters or the 85s, I kind of just took out of the question in general because we're not focusing on the artists, we're focusing on, honestly, the athletes that are performing. Now, this is actually going to break down the camera package that we are going to use for this shoot. And I told you what camera we're using, but I'll kind of give some explanations as to why. For this shoot, we are using the Blackmagic Full Frame 6K. And my personal opinion for this camera is that in terms of image quality, it holds up right with things like my, well, my red Komodo X over here. It does hold up pretty decently and it's actually kind of a plus because that camera's full frame where this one isn't. So you are gonna get a little bit more depth of field and a little bit more width, which actually helps out a lot because of the location that we're going to be using. Another thing that's really great about this guy is that at 400 ISO, exposing for darker skin tones works perfectly great. I've been talking about this in previous videos, but in terms of my litmus test for cameras is that if you could expose for darker skin tones, it's kind of the camera I'm probably gonna keep in my kit or at least one that I'm gonna use fairly often. Another cinematic tip, if you really, really want to improve how you do things, is to also like and subscribe to this channel. Uh, I'm going to start putting out a lot more behind-the-scenes videos in the midst of some of the gear stuff as well, so not only do you know about the thing, you actually know how to use the thing as well. So just hit that button down below, it's free, but let's just move on for the rest of the video. Now, because of the ergonomics in the Blackmagic Full Frame 6K, it's not the best handheld shooter in the world, especially with some of the rolling shutter that a lot of you guys don't like. However, it actually might be a low-key sleeper for a gimbal, but I actually Actually have to save that for another video because uh, well we'll talk about it later another thing that I also wanted to do is because we we're using some of the house lights that were in the location I want to be able to shoot in b-raw that way we had a little bit more control over the colors when we were in post I did have to make a couple of adjustments in the color grade after setting up my lighting and I want to give myself the most amount of flexibility as I possibly could you definitely could have shot this on an fx3 or an fx30 but while using 10-bit versus 12-bit raw you are gonna have a little bit more flexibility and you're gonna be able to push the image a bit more to accommodate for some of those situations where you might not be able to put your own lights in some of the places in the location. Another thing that I wanted to talk about was some of the lens choices. Now going back to some of the research that I did with the locked off shots and having a lot of wide angle or fisheye lenses, I decided I was going to go with two lenses that didn't cross 35 millimeters. I use a 16 millimeter DZO Vespa Prime at f2.8 and I also use the IRIX 21 millimeter. The reason why I decided to go with two wide angle lenses was honestly to kind of match that aesthetic of some of those older music videos from the late 90s, early 2000s. At the time, there wasn't a lot of people running around on gimbals, and there wasn't a ton of really shaky handheld videos as well, so I decided I was going to lock off and focus on the location, but also making sure I was shooting at a focal length wide enough to actually cover the entire location, and some of these sets had 3, 5, 12 plus dancers at the same time, so you need a lens that's going to be wide enough to accommodate for that. Now, these lenses do have drastically different character from each other. The DZO is a little bit more halfway between vintage and clinical, where the IRIX is incredibly sharp and incredibly clinically clean, which also means you have to do a little bit of adjustments when you're in DaVinci Resolve to get them to sort of match up, but that's nor here nor there, and it's fairly easy to do. <laughs> Oh, 
let's go into our first scene. This one's actually the easiest and it only requires one light that I brought in. Now with this location, what we noticed here is that there's gonna be these pot lights that are gonna be at the top. There's about a few of them that was actually bringing in some light, some top down lighting for the entire kind of box that this shot was in. Now, these are pretty neutral. They were even a little bit on the cooler side. If I was to guess, they'd be somewhere between like 5,800 to 6,500 Kelvin. I could be wrong on here, but overall they were a bit more neutral, a bit on the cool side in terms of light there. Now, for me personally with darker skin tones, I don't necessarily like having cool or neutral lights. This might be a little bit too much if I was to rely on it, so I actually brought in my own fixture in order to help mitigate that and to also make sure that we're lighting our skin tones perfectly. Now, one of the things I did use onto here was going to be the FC300 by Nanlite. Now, because I'm in an indoor location, I don't necessarily need these super powerful lights. I don't necessarily need this to be the most powerful light in the world. All I need is something that's bicolor and if it works inside. And also I put a 150 softbox in here to make sure that I actually was able to get enough coverage in terms of having soft lighting for all the subjects in this kind of box shape. Now what's cool about this is you're also gonna get some return off the walls. I deliberately decided that I wasn't going to uh, grid this guy off. I wanted to make sure that all of that light was bouncing on both sides of the wall. It's a pretty confined space. So that way, if there's anything that I miss in the light coming from the key side, it would bounce back and I would still have some pretty even exposure. However, even when you're looking at this image, there is gonna be a little bit of fall off on the talent's face from the key side going onwards. It's not exactly a perfect Rembrandt lighting, but I didn't necessarily want it to be. But this was fairly easy because I just put a big soft source almost directly in front of this kind of square shaped box that was here. Now what's cool about this guy and using a soft light, especially in an enclosed space, that you could actually get your coverage as well. I'm gonna show you a couple of different shots where you use the exact same lighting setup, and it worked pretty well because we can get a couple of shots without having to change up our lighting. Now one thing that I didn't mention was the color temperature on my FC300. Now for me personally when working with darker skin tones, I kind of prefer to go a little bit warmer than whatever my ambient is going to be. It's a little cheat and it doesn't have to be that much, but I think I was sitting around 5,000 here, maybe even 5,600, but nonetheless, I was still a little bit warmer. And that way on the skin tones, it doesn't look too blue. What ends up happening is if I put something that's like 6,500 Kelvin, it starts to look a little bit purpley or just doesn't look as natural as I'd like it. I like to cheat my color temperature a little bit more in my lighting so that way those skin tones pop, but also it helps me out a little bit in the grade because once we fully graded these clips, it did look pretty good and the skin tones looked fine. Now, one of the things I also do with leveraging locations is that if I can make the same exact setup and change it in my grade and post, then I'm absolutely going to do that. The two clips I showed you were the exact same lighting setup, more or less. One of the things that we did here is because there's actually a gigantic light on this wall over here that was bringing out like a 5600 Kelvin, that kind of acts as my backlight in order to give that silhouette effect. This is also going to be a white enclosed wall. So anything that's obviously not going to be completely white is going to come up as a shadow, which really, really worked well. And it was incredibly easy to set up because I didn't need to use any extra fixtures. This is actually pretty simple to do. This doesn't necessarily require a lot of thinking in it. But what I wanted to do was make sure that we had this light in the background that was just bright enough that it didn't necessarily blow things out. But at the same time, you could still see some of the shadow details that are into here from that white wall and because it's spilling all over the place it's spilling on the walls it's spilling on the ceiling it's spilling on the floor you're going to be able to get some return but at the same time if you're shooting your camera from the front angle you're still going to get that silhouette with a couple of details now this is also going to be a very similar shot as well this is the exact same setup except we've made one twist we still have that light wall that's at the back there that's actually softened up as well that's giving all that return into the room and then i've just added my fc 300 over here that's still gonna be on that big softbox at 150. It's still enough coverage that you still get some that's gonna be on here. You still get some that's gonna be on here. You also still get all of that light that's gonna be on that half of the face and then falls off going the other way, the opposite way of that key light. Using this is kind of like a two light setup because that back wall is a little bit more mesh. So that way you're able to actually have some pretty even lighting, but at the same time, if my key light is more powerful than what the backlight is, you are gonna get a little bit of that contrast and a little bit of that look. But at the same time, that's still one fixture on a big softbox and just using location to your advantage. Oh, yeah, Yeah. In our hearts and minds, 
Okay, like and for the last one, we're actually gonna go into this all black room, which we did add a couple of different lights, but honestly, it's not the most complicated thing in the world. Now, one of the things we also did again is we had that big FC 300 on that big softbox. That 150 does a ton of work actually coming down on most of the talent, which is actually kind of surprising. There's no bounce or anything coming down from here. So we set this guy up right about over here. This is about 5,600 Kelvin that's gonna go at the top. And that actually helped light up pretty much everybody on here. We just used a singular light, which was really surprising because there was a bunch of different people on here. We also had gimbal movement as well. And um, yeah, that actually did a really good job. Now, one of the things we also did, because if this black wall was just left to how it was, it would kind of look one dimensional and flat. So we decided to add in a couple of uh, fixtures in here to actually get some RGB going. So right over here, I'm gonna put the Pavo Slim and this is obviously going to be set to red. And this is actually giving a bunch of that red light you're starting to see into here. And also we have the same Pavel Slim at the other side. And it's also giving all that light that you can see on the corners here. All that light, red light coming through. That's going to give you a little bit of an edge. It's really nice because it does help make things a little bit more three-dimensional. And we say things like being able to pop things off of the background, but when you have a black background, there's not much to pop off of. Now, one of the things we also did to make sure that we kind of had more of a leading line is that some of the times when we were actually getting into our shots, and this is more of a camera movement than a lighting breakdown, uh, whenever we were getting into some of our shots, we try to make sure that there was somebody in the middle of these shots that we would always kind of come back to you. So the people on the sides were kind of like leading lines for the choreography or whoever was going to be in the middle. Now, we did a couple of insert shots that weren't the main choreography, and that's where you're going to see like kind of the dance circle that's going around outside of some of the gimbal movements or some of those kind of cutaways that were going in between the video. But one of the things we like to do onto here was to kind of give that centralized person to be in the middle where that way if we want to put our light in that direction of that person that's going to be in the middle in this case it's petra they're going to be the most lit person in the room although this entire set was lit but that's just a really unfunny joke now i wish i could tell you that this was the most cinematic story driven shoot in the world but just because it was a choreography video that petra is going to be able to use to get further dance jobs or use it for other purposes doesn't necessarily mean that you can't practice cinematography and also make sure that you're going to have good work at the end of the day just because it's not a short film or commercial doesn't mean you have to take a play off and here are some tips that you can use if you're in a similar situation. The first thing and kind of what I talked about before is leveraging your location. If you're a solo shooter or a small team, picking your location is going to become that much more important because sometimes it could do the heavy lifting for you. Sometimes you don't have the ability to work with an art department and have a bunch of different things and furniture and things put into the room in order for you to get the shot that looks good to you and looks good for the piece. Oftentimes you're going to book a location and you're going to deal with whatever's there and you're going to to know how to use that to your advantage. The one thing that I did was I used a big soft light, especially with big groups of people, in order to make sure that I could use whatever's inside of the location in general, and then I could add a couple of fixtures to help light it up to make things a little bit better. Another thing that I did, which actually was kind of refreshing, was creating creative restraints. One of the things that I wanted to do is I didn't want to add in too many elements in terms of the shoot. I didn't use the black magic on a gimbal for too much. I kind of only use it near the end. But what I wanted to do was make sure that I had a camera that stayed on sticks. So I had to focus on the composition, my lens choices, my lighting, and to make sure that everything coordinated perfectly. It actually helped me think on the fly and come up with a couple of new ideas that we didn't really think about if I was fumbling around with gear all day long. When I only had wide angle lenses to choose from, what I had to do was get a little bit more creative in terms of some of the camera angles and the camera movement that I was going to use through the shoot. I might not have thought about getting up on a ladder and getting a top down angle of some of the pieces going or thinking of actually shooting a couple of insert shots to go between some of the main choreography to add a little bit more depth to the overall video at the end. If I was fumbling around with five different lenses and six lights and a nine person crew, some of those things might have got overlooked and I might have not had the creative space to think outside the box for once. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is practice how you play. Objectively, this is not necessarily the most complex shoot in the world, but that doesn't mean that you should take a play off in your cinematography and take every opportunity that you can in order to practice. You never know when some of the sets and some of the scenarios that you might have used in a choreography video is going to be the same setup as something that you're going to use on a much bigger set 
set with a much bigger budget at a later day. Keeping in mind that just because you have things that might not be the biggest budget in the world doesn't mean that you should take a playoff. I was guilty of that a couple of years ago. When something didn't pay enough, I would just kind of slack off and not put my best in and not do some of the research and make some of those technical choices in order to put my best foot forward. Even if it's something that's incredibly small, you still want to be able to put 100% effort into it. Do that research beforehand in terms of what you're going to be shooting. Make a couple of creative choices to give you your best efforts and obviously try your best to do a great job. That being said, I wanted to share some behind the scenes. I don't really talk about too many of the things that I work on every now and again, but I'm going to try to do that a little bit more often, which is why this video came up in the first place. That being said, I hope you guys enjoy the video. Send a like if you want to. And if you guys are watching this right now, I'm in a secret location that you'll kind of find out in a couple of days. But I'll see you in the next one. Peace.